Hello and welcome to Foreign Exchange. I'm Daljit Dhaliwal. This week we are devoting our entire program to the growing international water crisis. We'll talk with Pulitzer Center reporter Alex Stonehill about the toxic sacred rivers in India and Pulitzer Center director John Sawyer about what needs to be done. All this and more coming right up on Foreign Exchange, where America meets the world. This program is made possible through the generous support of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, making grants to promote international understanding and address the root causes of global poverty. And now, Daljit Daliwal. Last fall, we devoted an entire program to water scarcity and the link to conflict in East Africa. We're pleased to welcome back Pulitzer Center's sponsored reporter, Alex Stonehill. After attending the World Water Forum in Istanbul, Alex traveled to India to report on the growing sanitation problems there. Hello, Alex. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. So let's start with your reporting from Lake Victoria, uh, the Lake Victoria area of Africa. Can you give us any updates on the drought conditions? Has anything changed? Well, I think that the, the East African region got a bit of relief uh, this last rainy season from the, the drought that had been um, going on for the last few years. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, tensions have, have only increased around Lake Victoria. Um, specifically, my colleague Ernest Waititu has been reporting on the, the conflict between uh, Kenya and Uganda over Mingingo Island, which is a tiny island that, that has a lot of fishing around it and as the lake levels have fallen due to drought and, and dam construction in Uganda. Um, the, the fishing stock has gone down and, and fishermen have gone, come into conflict and now the two governments of the two countries uh, have, have sort of started disputing the territory and, and arguing over who, who really owns it and who owns the fishing rights there. So they're disputing it rather than coming up with a regional framework or some kind of consensus to on, on how to remedy uh, the conflicts over Lake Victoria? Well, there are efforts to do that on a larger scale um, around the, the entire Lake Victoria Nile Basin um, uh, system. Um, there, there is a Nile Basin initiative effort that's basically to bring those countries together. And I think that the parties are sort of trying to come to the table, but but in this in the smaller scale, just between Kenya and Uganda, this this you know very very small island has become a, a huge issue. And your, your your reporting on water issues also took you to the World Water Forum um, in Istanbul. What were the key concerns that came up there? Well, I mean the the World Water Forum is is not just about um, dealing with with the water crisis unfortunately it's also about um, you know just water technology sort of a showcase for water technology um, and and uh, countries talking about about water issues um, but there was a, a lot of we did we did see a lot of really great you know people bringing really great water technologies um, uh, that, that can be helpful in relieving the the world water and sanitation crisis to, to the table and sort of exchange of those ideas um, but as far as uh, vast conclusions, I think, I, I think the big conclusion is that there's just not enough resources being put towards uh, water for the poor and sanitation for the poor in the world. There's clearly a theme here because um, after Istanbul, you traveled to, to India, which of course is dealing with, um, without success, I suppose, trying to get a handle on its water and sanitation issues. How did you frame your reporting there? Because you, in, in, you were in New Delhi, right? Mm -hmm. I, I was in New Delhi, and basically I was, I was focusing on the Yamuna River, which is the river that runs through New Delhi. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of the, the central sewage system for, for the, the city of New Delhi, unfortunately, as the city grows. Um, you, you go ab about a mile upriver from, from the city, and it, the Yamuna is this beautiful green river with people fishing on it. And then as soon as it enters the city, uh, it's, it's basically drained out to, to feed the city's water supply, and a few hundred yards further downriver, pumped back in essentially raw sewage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's definitely a, a, a body of water in crisis. And what is behind the government's inability or to, to provide the most basic services to its citizens? Well, there's a couple of issues there. I mean, I, I do honestly believe that the, the government of Delhi is is really trying. They've done a lot of things to, 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 to put in, you know, temporary sewers, and they've recently passed laws actually allowing them to, to serve um, illegal sediment, settlements, slums, with, 
with uh, sewage technology, which, which they weren't allowed to do previously. Um, so they're putting a lot of money into it and a lot of effort into it, but they just can't keep up with the the level of population growth there. I mean, it's just it's just staggering, you know. And they, is is there a sewer system to talk of? There is, and actually, interestingly enough, uh, it's uh, in Calcutta, not New Delhi, but but in India, they had the third modern sewage system in the world, um, built by the British in the in the Victorian era. So, I think this isn't an issue of them, you know, of a developing country just sort of catching up and and developing to the to the model set by the U.S. or the U.K. or something like that. I think it's an issue of there's there's some solutions that you know don't work for for a, for a city like New Delhi that's just growing so fast and has so many poor people. I think you have to look for other other methods. Okay, well we have a clip from your reporting in New Delhi, so let's just take a quick look at that. Very, very simple. Your technology yeah. is very good. I don't disagree, but my problem is is it available for all? If everybody in the U.S. goes to a very clean toilet, does not make solution of the whole world's problem. Our concern is toilet for all. Is your technology going to touch even the poorest on the street, anywhere in the world? No, but this can. So when one defecates in the seat, so the storm water and solid excreta, they come to one pit. The other is standby. When that pit is full, just stop this pit and open the standby pit. Again, that pit will take two, three years to be full. By that time, the waste in the first pit, the, the gases and water of the waste are sucked by the good earth and whatever is left that is pathogen free bacteria free no order no hatred the user does not depend on any other outsider for cleaning it with his own hand he can clean the pit throw it in your kitchen garden and if you don't have any kitchen garden then sell it out and that pit is once again ready for recycling of people implementing a technology like that for for more than you know a, a small fraction of the population is is very difficult and right now the the Delhi government is mostly focused on maintaining this this uh, crippled sewer system you know but what do you think uh, Alex is at stake for India's rapidly growing economy if uh, the country doesn't get this right well I mean there there's definitely just the issue of of having a having a nice city they're supposed to be hosting the commonwealth games there in a, in a few months um and and supposed to be having a you know rowing competitions on this river that's just you know filthy bubbling with methane gas so so there's definitely just sort of modernization i mean and 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 all these health issues you know and there there's all sorts of uh of, of health problems that result from a, a lack of proper sanitation and people dying from it every day in delhi and around the world Okay, Alex Stonehill, good to see you again. Thank you very much for coming back and talking to us uh, about your assignment. Thank you. Our In Focus segment this week includes two short videos from the Pulitzer Center's work in New Delhi. The first focuses on the stark contrasts in water access in a South Delhi neighborhood where rich and poor live close together. The second gives us a look at New Delhi's Yamuna River, for many Indians a holy river, but also one of the country's most polluted. We're in the Sandkunj, a rich part of South Delhi, where meeting Jodi Sharma, president of the organization FORCE, which is involved in many of the water projects in Delhi. She introduces us to the area and its water problems. These are people with money and uh, the right technological know-how. Right across the street, you've got a slum cluster, uh, very poor, one of the poorer uh, <clears throat> slum clusters here, where the only source of water for them is a water tanker which comes at 6 o'clock in the morning. 
and uh, you know when when that tanker comes in you see this awful sight of little children clambering on top uh, of the tanker to put in their hoses and uh, you've got hundreds of water people holding their uh, water can their jerry cans uh, which in, they fill up with water from those uh, hose pipes so there's fighting screaming shouting everything that happens there they get on an average about 300 liters per family of 6 to 7 people per day whereas here people stock up on about 3000 to 4000 liters per family of four people per day so what people have done as a coping up strategy is to put these uh, overground and in a lot of cases underground water tanks of anywhere between 2000 to 3000 liter storage capacity which are connected to the uh, supply pipelines and they they've also put an online pump uh, like you see here uh, which sucks in water from uh, the pipeline and fills up the this tank so it's a, it's an it's an i me myself kind of um, approach that people follow um, so they fill up their water tanks and later they pump it up to their overhead tanks which then supplies to all the the faucets in their uh, households so instead of the 500 liter capacity that the government had um, planned for you now have every household with about 3000 4000 liters storage capacity which is filled up all the time and this is being done only because they perceive a scarcity so in terms of water management it's actually a vicious cycle which just makes the scarcity worse the water tanker crossed the street stayed for about 10 minutes then is gone many of the containers are still empty and i doubt that anyone here got more than 50 liters as i see them carry home their buckets and empty containers i can't help wondering what would happen if they knew to just cross the street is tens of thousands liters of water just stored for a rainy day सवेरे से आके हम ये पन्नी शेर ऊपर से गिरते थे इनको पकड़ते हैं कबाड़ा शबारा निकाल लेते हैं नारियल फारियल होते हैं इनको निकाल लेते हैं ऐसे भी मिल जाते हैं उसी से हमारा गुजारा चल जाता है हम जब से आए मतलब घर कभी भी नहीं गए हैं इधर ही पड़े हुए दिस इज यमुना रिवर अकॉर्डिंग टू हिंदू माइथोलॉजी it is called the sister of uh, river ganges which came from the hairs of lord shiva it is very ancient place in ancient time there were lamps instead of these lights and a lot of people were coming for taking bath but nowadays seeing this all this pollution because a lot of industrial cvs are thrown in it and garbage पीपल डोंट वॉन्ट टू कम और जैसे ही अब ये देखो ये क्या जमा हो रहा है ये फलोट नहीं है ये गलती तो है नहीं पहले इसको ऐसे पानी पीते थे सोना गेरते थे तो वो सोना दिखता था आज इसमें तुम कुछ भी गेर दो तो दिखाई नहीं देगा यमुना एंटर्स डेली विद इन फिफ्टी within 50 uh, to 100 meters you find this drain coming and emptying into into river yamuna mm-hmm. and that's the biggest and it's almost 1500 million liters of waste water that goes into yamuna through that drain all this water comes out from our household from our industry from our fields so every time you flush in 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 delhi that goes into the river so everything as in we take all water from yamuna for our daily use and we leave behind everything that we use every day into the river one is cleaning a river on paper as in you you write something sign something create a document and the other is actually cleaning the river as in it's obvious enough that if there are bubbles coming out if there's gas poisonous gas that's coming out if it's black that means that that money has gone somewhere else that money has not been utilized we're not talking about a state where we are 
where we are imagining or where we are scared about future. This is present. We are talking about our present right now, a dead river. Last November, we devoted an entire show to the global water crisis, focusing on the nearly one billion people who lack access to clean water and sanitation. We highlighted the work of our colleagues at the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting. Since then, the center has funded more reporting on water-related issues, from the massive desertification of north-central China to river pollution in India, to the melting glaciers in the high Himalayas, to the Carter Center's work in Ethiopia to combat waterborne diseases. I'm pleased to be able to be joined by John Sawyer, the Center's founder and executive director. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you, Dalja. So tell us a little bit more about the Center's new field reporting. Well, the field reporting on water has really taken us all over the world since we the last presented the East Africa reporting last November. As you say, we did the project in China, we did the work in South Asia and Nepal, Kashmir, Pakistan and India, and we did additional work in, in Kenya. And, and the idea is to put all of this up on the, on the Water Wars portal, the interactive portal that we've developed, and, and bring as many people around the world into that conversation as we can. Mm. What would you say all of those places have in common? What is the connection between these parts of the world and, and water in, in the very broadest sense of the world and how it relates to crisis? Well, with water, you have different types of crises. You have sanitation issues, you have access issues, you have shortage, a simple shortage of water. And the, in the China project, for example, Sean Gallagher, who is an exceptionally talented photographer, traveled some 2,500 kilometers across north central China looking at desertification in, in that country, which affects some 400 million people from the east all the way out to Xinjiang province and through outer Mongolia. And this is the yeah. transformation of arable and habitable land into, into, into desert. Into desert, moving sands, the, the, the loss of groundwater and, and whole cities that have disappeared. And, and at the same time, the Chinese attempt to, to cope with that, whether it's through population movement or irrigation programs and, and, and the like. And, and what Sean did in, in this journey was to, to give you a sense of, of how many people and how many different ways are affected by that crisis. It's an issue that's so underreported when you say compare it to global warming. Well, a lot of times it's un it, it underlies issues that we know about for other reasons. We don't, we don't see the connection to water. And, and Kashmir, for example, which has been a flashpoint, as you well know, between India and Pakistan for 60 years, uh, much at the root of that conflict is in part the Indus River. And the Indus River, uh, as, as our reports that, that Bill Wheeler and Anna Katarina Gravgard uh, reported, showed it begins in, in Kashmir in the, in the headlands of the Indus River, and the Indus River is the, the main source of water for, for Pakistan, much of which itself is, is desert, unarable land. But the, the agriculture of Pakistan depends on this water that flows down through Indian-controlled Kashmir. And so that's both a source of conflict, has been in the past, but it's also a source of potential conflict resolution because these two countries uh, well know that they have to figure out a way to, to parse the use of that water so that both of them can prosper and survive. And, and from the examples of the, the, the recent reporting that the center did, how are people adapting to their changing environment? Well, they're adapting, you know, it depends on, it depends on the place that you look. As I say, in China, there's population movement. There's, there's certainly been population movement in, in, in Kenya and Ethiopia and in, in dry zones. One of the projects that we did in, in Kenya was the more recent project was on the Kakuma the refugee camp in, in northwestern Kenya, which was famous for many years as a place where the lost boys from Sudan came. But that's also a place that's, that's very dry. It's been drought afflicted for the last three or four years. And the Turkana people who live just outside that camp uh, have desperate shortage of water. And so you're seeing the potential and the beginning of conflict between the Turkana, the host community, 
and the refugees who were still living, some 40,000 of them in the Kakuma camp. And so you had people there who were moved in from Sudan, from Ethiopia, from other countries, and, and they get relatively well supplied by, by non-governmental organizations, United Nations, and so on. But in the outskirts of that camp, the community that actually lives there uh, is under great friction. Now, you, you were also at the uh, World Water Forum in Istanbul, uh, which happened, I believe, it was this spring, right? This spring, yeah. right. Tell us a little bit about how you framed your reporting there. Well, what we really were trying to do with that, with that trip was to gather as many video moments as we could, and thinking in terms of this interactive web portal, the Water Wars site that we had set up at PulitzerGateway.org, and looking at that as a, as a venue for global conversation on water. And of course, as we discussed back in November, we took the project out to dozens of schools and universities around the United States. We involved schools in Nairobi and other countries in, in participating using these resources. And, and we thought after that first round of reporting, let's expand the reporting, let's add the number of voices. And so the Water Forum was a wonderful opportunity for that because it brought together people from literally all over the world. And so we went and, and I was there with two, Alex Stonehill, who, whose work we're seeing today, and also Ernest Waititu, a Kenyan journalist who worked with us on that project. And the three of us gathered some 40, 45 video clips, uh, everyone from journalists to experts to individuals we met, both in Ethiopia, where I traveled, and, and in India and Delhi, where, where Ernest and, and Alex uh, traveled after the, the forum. And so you got this wonderful array of short moments, people speaking in their own language about their own projects, their own perspective, and, and some of them might be students, some of them might be uh, the, the head of the Food and Agriculture Organization, for example, or the or Tishomi Tegebre, the, the head of the Carter Center in, in Ethiopia, talking about the work that they were doing. And, and you got this all in one place, the opportunity to see these perspectives and then to respond with your own perspective. As you're aware, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the crisis in traditional journalism and what, if anything, can be done to help it survive. Where do you fit into this, and how should we be thinking perhaps differently about journalism? Well, I think uh, organizations like ours, I think, are, are, are venues for experimentation and, and, and models for what journalism can be. And, and you know, I came from a background of 30 years in print journalism with a major regional newspaper. and. And I know very well the, the, the attitude of most of my, my peers in, in newspapers like that and the, even the largest papers, media outlets in the country, is that we cannot afford to do the things we used to afford. It's all, it's all about cutting back and the inability to do major investigative work, say, or major enterprise overseas work. It's too expensive. And the lesson of organizations like the Pulitzer Center, and, and there have been, you know, it's, it's exciting how many there have been that have arisen just in the last three or four years uh, with shoestring budgets like ours, very little limited resources, but are doing, in our case, we're doing 35, 40 projects a year all over the world, and, and we're partnering with major news media outlets uh, across the country, Europe and elsewhere, and it's doable. You're actually able to... There, to, are, there are models you can, you out can, there. Right. You can find... And, and we're figuring out ways to, to, to work with broadcast outlets. We've had a wonderful partnership with Foreign Exchange. We, we're developing relationships with a number of, of, of media, news media outlets. And, 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 you, and you're able to, to leverage you know, your good reporting. You identify an issue that's underreported. You, you identify great reporters who are as eager as you and I were when we started in this business, and as still many, am. you still are, <laughs> as, as am I, and, and that want to go out and do this work. And so you find a way to, to, to put together the, the relationships that make that possible, and, and then you, you market it as, as hard as you can to get it out to as many people. And part of it is finding new audiences. I mean, some of the most encouraging, exciting work that we've done is taking journalists out to universities and high schools. And we're beginning to get actually a revenue base from universities who have agreed to fund us to bring journalists in and actually give the journalists payments for speaking about their work. And of course, at the same time, that's exposing a new audience uh, to these important issues. And hopefully, you're creating the news consumers of the future. All right, John Sawyer, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you.
Water is just one of the big issues that the Pulitzer Center has taken on. Others include multiple reporting projects from Afghanistan and Iraq and cross-cutting looks at systemic issues such as food insecurity, women and children in crisis, and coming soon, fragile states and the human face of climate change. Each features interactive web portals similar to Water Wars and, of course, a chance to share your own stories. So take a look at palitzagateway.org and join the conversation. For more on this story and the others that we have featured on today's program, please visit foreignexchange.tv. And you can also drop us a line about the program while you're there. Until next week, I'm Daljit Dali Wal. Thank you for joining us. Foreign Exchange welcomes your feedback. Log on to foreignexchange.tv and send us your comments. You can also view episodes as streaming video and read the transcripts online. This program is made possible through the generous support of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, making grants to promote international understanding and address the root causes of global poverty.